strong bipartisan uh, vote, uh, reflective of the work that the administration did in negotiating the deal and the work that Democrats in the House did in improving the enforcement provisions, so uh, a good outcome. For the dairy industry, there are basically three very fundamental parts of this. One, the Canadian market becomes a bit more open uh, than it has been. Quotas have been improved and increased. We're going to watch how they implement those uh, quota increases to make sure that we get the benefit, the full benefit. Secondly, uh, the elimination of what is called Class 7. It's a way in which the Canadians price uh, powder, which has allowed them to export their powder uh, at a, a significant advantage over everyone else. And so they've seen a significant increase in exports and taking market share away from U.S. Uh, producers and processors. That's going to end. It's going to be replaced with a different pricing system that hopefully will avoid uh, a, uh, an advantage for the Canadian exports. And then third, uh, an opportunity for us to reopen, or if not, not necessarily reopen, but an opportunity for us to preserve the Mexican market, which is our number one market, but to do so in a way uh, that also protects our ability to sell cheeses that the European Union is attempting to try to get a monopoly on the use of, of certain names of cheeses. This is called a geographic indicator or indications. Uh, these GIs, basically under the agreement, a side letter, uh, there's a due process, there's a, a way in which the United States will be notified uh, if the EU seeks to have additional monopoly and protections, we'll be able to come in and object and say, no, no, this is a common name and everyone should be able to use it. So really important. Uh, tough to put a number on, on exactly how much more business there will be. Uh, the, it, once it's fully implemented, uh, the USMCA, will, it'll take several years for those tariff uh, quotas to be increased, but once it's fully implemented, the expectation is somewhere between 200 and 300 million dollars of additional business opportunity, which is, which is important. Uh, for some tomato growers, uh, pr primarily in the southeastern part of the United States, I, I think they were dissatisfied with the agreement because they feel uh, Mexican tomato growers have a competitive advantage or, or uh, flood the market, if you will, uh, to disadvantage their uh, tomato growing. Uh, they are obviously not satisfied, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, no trade agreement is ever perfect. Uh, that's why they are constantly renegotiated, and that's why it's important to note in this agreement that there is a provision for reviewing the terms and conditions of the agreement on a periodic basis, which is important. And I think the enforcement mechanisms that were added to the agreement really strengthen it. It provides a greater level of confidence and, and assurance that what people have agreed to do, they're actually going to do. There's no question this is an improvement over NAFTA. Uh, there are many industries that weren't even in existence at the time NAFTA was negotiated, and that was one of the reasons why it was important to modernize the agreement. Uh, and so those, those new uh, opportunities are, are involved in the agreement as well. So it's a more comprehensive agreement. Uh, it's a more enforceable agreement. It has stronger labor and environmental provisions. Uh, and while American agriculture doesn't necessarily have a large benefit from this agreement, again, the maintaining the status quo, keeping markets open, very, very important for U.S. agriculture. Each individual senator has their ability to make a decision. I, I think it's fair to say two things. One, this is clearly a better deal than NAFTA. And two, that a, a significant majority of senators and a significant majority of members of the House of Representatives felt that the enforcement provisions were improved to the point that they had confidence that this better deal would in fact be implemented in a way that would make it a better deal. Uh, obviously, some folks disagreed, but at the end of the day, it was a very strong bipartisan vote. It's a complicated formula that requires an understanding of what the Chinese were purchasing before the retaliatory tariff issues arose, before the trade war arose, adding to that a certain amount, a committed amount of additional purchases, uh, and then over a two-year period, it, it averaging out to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 billion of sales. Uh, the USTR, U.S. Trade Representative Office, has, is setting up an, its own separate implementation office. The sole responsibility of that office will be to monitor the performance of the Chinese in this particular agreement. You know, at the end of the day, the Chinese are famous for promising, uh, not so famous for delivering. And so it's going to be important in this agreement to make sure that we monitor performance on a regular basis. Uh, that we get information from the ag industry, the entire industry, 
what sales are taking place so that we can make sure that from January 1st of 2020 to Jan December 31st, 2020, that in fact these purchases have taken place. We won't know that until sometime in 2021. Uh, and if it turns out that these purchases are not being made, there is a provision, a series of provisions in the agreement that allow for the parties to essentially uh, raise a concern, have it adjudicated or determined, or in the alternative, to leave the deal. Uh, there is a process by which uh, the deal can be terminated uh, at either party's insistence. So uh, I, I think what, what I feel is that every day where there is performance is, is a good day, but I don't think we necessarily should be overly confident that for the next two years, every day will be a day of implementation and compliance. There are some good provisions in this agreement, no question about that. The, the USTR's office had done a good job in negotiating. For the dairy industry, there's no guarantee of specific purchases. In fact, there's no guarantee for any specific commodity that they will get X number of billions of dollars of purchases between the next couple of years. But it's anticipated that the oil seeds uh, and some of the uh, pr protein uh, commodities will probably get the lion's share of the purchases uh, because that's who have been most adversely affected and impacted by the retaliatory tariffs. On the dairy side, uh, you have to look at the non-tariff, non-scientific barrier sections of the agreement. Uh, pl places and, and opportunities where the Chinese are basically saying, in the past we created a difficult situation for you to get your plant registered so you could sell in our country. Or we made it hard for you to, to certify a particular product for sale in our country. We're now going to make it easier for you to certify and register your plants and your products. Uh, in the past, we've been a little bit uh, hesitant to allow your infant formula into our market. We're now going to make it easier for that infant formula to get into your market. Uh, we have always resisted the ability of utilizing whey permeate, not for feed additives, but for food, uh, human food consumption. Now we're going to basically allow that to take place. So there are very important provisions that if implemented the way they were intended will be of some benefit to the U.S. dairy industry. The infant formula uh, provision may be something that, that, it, that increases sales by $100 million, $200 million. Uh, time will tell. Uh, there is the same due process system, if you will, for GIs that we discussed with reference to USMCA. That's important to, to it, the cheese processors in this country. Um, and there's, a, 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 you know, I think an opportunity for us um, to, to ensure that uh, other aspects of agriculture also benefit. There's a provision that, that I know we worked on during my, uh, during my administration at USDA w where biotechnology traits would take forever to get approved by the Chinese. Well, now, according to this agreement, they're willing to do it within a certain period of time, within 24 months, instead of three or four or five years, as was the case before. So there are some positive aspects of this agreement, but again, the proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the implementation of the agreement. I think it's a little bit of both. I think we're going to see a resumption of markets that we had before. I think we're going to sell a lot more soybeans than we did before. I think we're going to sell uh, more pork in part because they need pork. Uh, their, their hog industry was devastated by African swine fever, and it's going to take a while for them to rebuild that hog industry. So that their consumers are now seeing very high prices for pork. So I, I would anticipate we'll see uh, some pork sales. I think we'll, the beef issue that you mentioned is an important one because it opens up a bit more, at least from a transparency standpoint, sales of beef. There, there was beef getting into China from the U.S., but it was getting in from, uh, through Hong Kong and, and a variety of other, other gray markets, if you will. Um, uh, the, they, for many, many, many uh, months, they were uh, prohibiting the use of our chicken getting into their market. That's uh, now uh, opened up. The, the $40 billion number is, is not just ag products, it's also seafood, so there'll be an opportunity as well for, uh, for that to be involved. So again, uh, a lot of opportunity here, potentially, right? Uh, it's a two-year agreement. Uh, don't know what happens afterwards. I, the concern I have about the $40 billion purchases is that whether or not there's adequate demand in China for $40 billion of American agricultural products. I, there's no question there's a demand for pork, 
there's no question that they can use soybeans, but how much do they need? And are we creating a circumstance where they are purchasing product, storing product, and then two years from now will be created with a circumstance where they have an oversupply and, and not likely to be in a business position to purchase for, uh, from us. And so are we going to have a, a very nice stable market for a couple of years, and then are we going to see uh, a drop in that market, or are we going to have the kind of stability that I think farmers in this country would love to have uh, a market that is consistent and stable? Well, that gets back to the supply and demand piece of this. If they are purchasing from others, then they have to purchase from us, and they can't consume it all then they're obviously going to store it. And if they get it to a point where they've stored too much, then obviously they're, at some point in time in the future, they're going to drop off their purchases. And so you don't have that consistency and that predictability that you need to be able to make business decisions here. Uh, that's why it's important, I think, for, for our industry specifically, for dairy in particular, to diversify. It's, it's important for us to look at other markets in addition to China, as big as it is, to look at ways in which we can take full advantage of the Southeast Asian market ways in which we can take advantage of Japan and South Korea, maybe someday opening up India uh, as well, and then beginning to figure out a longer, longer term strategy of how we access markets that will continue to grow and develop in Africa. Uh, I think it's going to be important for U.S. agriculture to have a long term look here and not just be focused on one major purchaser. I, I think we run the risk of, of something upsetting the apple cart here. Uh, maybe it'll It'll be something that happens in the South China Sea, and before you know it, or maybe it's something in relationship to Hong Kong or Taiwan or, uh, or North Korea, that creates a circumstance where we're at odds with China, and that impacts and affects uh, trade with China. I'm not confident we're ever going to get to phase two, uh, simply because what we're asking the Chinese to do in a phase two negotiation is to fundamentally change the way they do business to fundamentally move away from state-owned enterprises that they subsidize and support and provide those enterprises with a competitive advantage in their market. I, that is central not just to their economy, but it's also central to the Communist Party maintaining control uh, in China. Uh, so asking them to change their way of doing business is really asking them to uh, essentially change their entire philosophy. I think that is a pretty heavy lift. Um, and it's a particularly heavy lift when you're only doing it alone, when you haven't solicited uh, and developed and taken the time to put together a coalition, an alliance of, of countries that are being similarly disadvantaged by that, being able to come in and say to China, look, you need to be part of the international global uh, system. To do that, you, need to, you can't have this state-owned enterprise process that undercuts that. Uh, it's going to be important for you to make sure that you uh, the, the, make, it's going to be important for us to make sure the EU, uh, South America, and maybe even uh, some of the African nations are joining us and some of the other Asian nations are joining us in saying to China, you've got to change your rules. That might put enough pressure on China uh, to take a look at fundamental change. But if it's just the U.S., and I just don't think that we are going to be able to force them or push them into a situation like that. It gets complicated because it gets into the politics of, of the U.S. political system. Uh, we obviously are, uh, are in an election year, and I'm sure the Chinese are very interested to see what happens in the election. Um, so I don't, I, I don't really anticipate that we're going to see a whole lot of activity short of what we've now seen, which is the agreement being signed, and a slow, steady process of implementation, hopefully, and a series of purchases that take place over time. Um, after the election, depending upon the results, I don't know what the Chinese reaction will be. Um, and I don't know where we go from here. Uh, I think this is a very, very difficult relationship because it's not just a trade relationship. There's a division within the current administration about how to deal with China. There are some who believe we need to be engaged with China, that we need to figure out how to work and how to effectively compete, but in an inappropriate way. And we don't see them as, quote, unquote, an enemy, but we see them as, a, as, a, as someone who is a competitor and somebody that we need to keep a wary eye on. There are others who believe that we should disengage our economies, uh, that we should go our own way and let China go its own way and not be as uh, reliant upon each other. Uh, and that, that battle has not yet, within this administration, I don't think, been re totally resolved. So that's why you have phase one. And what phase one essentially did, from an agricultural perspective, it did deal with a series of irritants uh, and issues and barriers 
over time that have been parts of negotiation and it did provide a fairly comprehensive effort to try to eliminate so many of those barriers and for that the administration USTR and others should be uh, should be congratulated but in terms of in terms of of long term changes in terms of of assurances that China is going to always be this way this is a, a, essentially a two year agreement and it and it's subject to either party terminating on a moment's notice so again i think uh, to me, uh, great that we've got the agreement, great that we don't see an escalation of the trade war, great that we have uh, a promise to purchase additional agricultural products, and as that promise is fulfilled, that's good news for American agriculture. Uh, but I think it's appropriate to have a healthy dose of skepticism and concern so that you keep an eye on implementation. You know, I think that's one of the challenges, especially for the dairy industry. Many of the other commodities that do business with China do the business through state-owned enterprises, which means uh, they get they, those state enterprises get instructions from the government, and the government has the power to say, for this deal, don't worry about the tariffs. For this deal, don't collect the tariffs. For this year, we'll reimburse you for the tariff. So uh, the tariffs don't become an issue. Dairy doesn't operate quite in the same way. There's not as many activities through the state-owned enterprises as there is through private sector. Private sector doesn't have the capacity to sort of waive or, or not, uh, not, not take into consideration retaliatory tariffs. So it's going to be up to the Chinese government to figure out how to do that in a way that the retaliatory tariffs don't create a barrier to the Chinese fully performing their agreement uh, to purchase products. I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, and uh, we'll obviously have to keep an eye on how they do it uh, so that we make sure that we're not at a, at a disadvantage. But at the end of the day, this is a pretty hard number. So uh, sometime in 2021, we will know whether, in fact, the Chinese purchased $40 billion of agriculture and seafood products. If they did, great. If they didn't, then the question is, what does the U.S. do? The U.S., there's a dispute resolution process uh, that is multi-leveled. Do they go through that? Do they decide that the Chinese weren't really serious after all? Do they terminate the agreement? Yet to be determined. In a perfect world, uh, the U.S. would have been able to say, if you aren't performing the agreement, we're going to reinstate tariffs, we're going to escalate tariffs, and you can't retaliate. But we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, we live in a world where you're negotiating. Uh, and each party has uh, a certain level of leverage and power over, each, over the other party. And you, the, the, I think the fact that you can terminate the agreement is an acknowledgement of the fact that you're dealing with two very large economies, two very large countries, two very powerful countries, and that neither one can compel or force the other to do that which they don't want to do. Uh, and I think that's, an, uh, that's another important aspect of, of, of China. Uh, very, very rarely can you compel the Chinese to do something that they don't themselves want to do. They usually operate in their own self-interest. They're very good at negotiating. They're very smart. They're very tough. They're very persistent. Um, and I, you know, I think Ambassador Lighthizer uh, was also tough and persistent. Uh, and I think uh, the result is an agreement. The agreement essentially, if you do the numbers, what we're going to do is over four years, we're going to roughly sell them the same amount of agricultural products that we would have sold them if this thing hadn't triggered. But uh, the barriers that have been removed, the barriers that have, that have been uh, reduced uh, on these non-tariff and non-scientific barriers, that's real and that's, that's, that's important progress. We had recently determined China, we had recently put China on a warning list or a list of currency manipulation. So this was a, a way of essentially taking them off that list, which would have potentially created some challenges for them. Uh, it is not surprising that the Chinese press is basically uh, reasserting the fact that there are ways in which this agreement can be performed and there are ways in which this agreement can be avoided. That is par for the course. That is something to be anticipated. That's why you have to be a bit skeptical and that's why you have to see performance. Uh, and every performance, every, every day that you get performance is a good day. And every day you don't get performance is a day that you should begin to wonder whether or not this agreement is everything it, uh, that some folks are, are suggesting. 
I, I don't think anybody can tell you with a great deal of certainty that everything that's been agreed upon in this agreement is actually going to happen. But I'm glad that we have an agreement. I'm glad that, the, that there's at least a truce, that we're not seeing a ratcheting up because that would have been even more difficult and devastating for American agriculture and, and for the dairy industry. You know, the problem with that shotgun is, uh, analogy, is that, is that the other side's got a shot down, a shotgun behind their door. You see, uh, and, and that's the problem. Uh, we, saw, we saw dairy sales drop off by f somewhere between 45 and 47 uh, percent because of tariffs. And those tariffs haven't gone away. So they're still there. And hopefully they figure out a way to work around them uh, to be able to purchase more dairy products. Uh, they did uh, provide a one-year waiver on, on whey permeate because they saw the benefit to their hog industry uh, for uh, consuming more whey permeate. They may have to do the same thing in terms of whey permeate go going into human, for human consumption. So all of that is yet to be determined. But again, good that we have an agreement, good that there's not an escalation, good that we at least have some idea of what that agreement uh, consists of. Now uh, we need to monitor and now we need to keep our fingers crossed and hope that this, uh, this actually gets implemented in the way it was intended. Well, it just went into effect, and so it's, uh, it, it, you know, we're not sure that I can give you specific numbers. What I can tell you is this. We lost a bit of market share on ingredient sales last year in Japan, powder sales, whey, uh, things of that nature. Why? Because we, uh, as a result of pulling out of TPP, and as a result of the EU and the New Zealand uh, governments essentially entering into a trade agreement with the Japanese that provided for an elimination of tariffs, we had to pay a tariff our competitors did not, and when you're dealing with powder and a commodity like that, that price differential makes a difference between whether or not you get a sale or don't get a sale. So we lost market share. So I anticipate uh, with the implementation of phase one, where we now are now on a level playing field with our competitors, that things will go back and we will reclaim that market share that was lost in 2019. On the cheese side, we weren't as disadvantaged today. We would have been disadvantaged in the future. Uh, so I, I would expect that we'll continue to see robust cheese sales. Uh, this is a country that is just consuming cheese at a very significant rate, and it's anticipated that they'll continue to do so for the next 10 years at a rate of 4% per year. So plenty of opportunity in Japan. There's one other thing that I think impacts and affects the dairy industry, which is that we, uh, for the first time since 2015, are not dealing with the overhang of EU inter intervention stocks. In other words, when the EU changed its way of, uh, of compensating and, and supporting agriculture, what they did is they created a circumstance where there was overproduction, if you will, uh, in the European dairy industry. And that overproduction led to the stockpiling of a substantial amount of powder. Th those are called intervention stocks. And essentially what happens is the EU, over a period of time, would slowly uh, uh, release a portion of those surplus uh, stocks into the market, further depressing the market. So for the first time in 2015, there isn't any powder in those intervention stocks. So we have uh, a much less pressurized market, if you will. The clog in the system has been eliminated, and so that should lead to opportunities for us uh, for more sales. Uh, and it should lead to uh, fewer European sales uh, on, on the powder side. And where I think we're beginning to see some in, uh, elements of that in, in Southeast Asia, uh, significant increases in November of last year, the last uh, month that we have data for. Uh, we saw the best year, best month ever of skim milk powder sales uh, in the history of the industry in November. So hopefully that trend continues. Hopefully we see the continued robust purchases in Southeast Asia, and hopefully we see the benefit of that uh, intervention stock issue being resolved.